you have your Bibles this evening, turn to Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13, as we present to you, outrageous, the story of Samson. Now, I remember growing up and seeing all the children's books and the Bible stories, and about all I knew about Samson was what you saw there. That was the opinion I had. What about that, Miss Julie? Yes, that's what I had in my storybook, him with his hands against the pillars. Mm, And that did happen. That did happen. Uh, Samson may have not been uh, the uh, bodybuilder type. He may have been more like a regular guy. Uh, We don't know. We're not told in Scripture. But uh, he had an unexplainable power, an unexplainable power. And God's Word will help explain that power. And uh, let's look at Samson, the birth of Samson, chapter 13. Of course, things were not well in the land of Israel. And the Lord had delivered that country into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. But there was a certain man. You see, God always has a plan. And he had a plan for the Israelites. Uh, In their history, uh, it seems like time and time again, God's people would rebel. Uh, God would have to discipline them. Um, Then they would repent. And then God would deliver them time and time again. And it's really a story of us, isn't it? I mean, that happens to us. How many times do we have to be delivered by the power of God because we just rebel? We don't do what we're supposed to do. And that was the way it was with Samson. So in that time, there was a certain man from Zorah, a family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, I know that you're barren and you have no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, what we've got to realize about this, that God is always work, already working. He's always working in, with his people, but he's already working uh, in, in the case of Manoah and his wife. They're under the oppression of the evil Philistines, and God is seeking to deliver them. So what happens here is this man named Samson was set apart, sanctified by the Lord God himself. Where it says the angel of the Lord came and visited, we believe this is a pre-incarnate visit of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He will not reveal his identity as it says later in in the chapter. But he was simply informing these people what they were fixing to experience. And it is an experience like we see in the Bible with uh, a lot of uh, different people, Abraham and Sarah. Uh, well, you know, uh, John the Baptist. Uh, and he was had said to take in a Nazarite vow. But this was even more prepared than a vow. You see, Samson was set aside even before he was conceived. The angel, or the Lord, says, Indeed, now you are barren, and you have borne no children, but you shall receive and bear a son. Now, he says, before the child is even uh, conceived, do not drink wine or similar drink, and do not eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive a bare son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So 
this this pledge that uh, Manoah and his wife would make to raise this child as a Nazarite from the womb. So it's not like Samson, after he was born and grew, took a Nazarite vow. He was indeed set apart as a Nazarite by God. The things that, that he was not to do, and nor was his mother, was no wine or anything from the vine. He had to be alert. He had to have the right attitude. There, had, there could be no, um, uh, no influence of any kind of intoxication. He had to have the right appearance. This would show his commitment to God that no razor would come to the hair. So, you know, we all know the story about his hair, and we're going to get into that, uh, but that's not where the strength came from. We know that the strength came from the Lord. It also tells us he was not to touch anything dead, a dead body, or anything unclean. So he had to be about the living. He had to have the right action. So God sanctified him with the right attitude, the right appearance to be a Nazarite, and also the right action. So the Lord created in this man a unique relationship. And we go uh, on in chapter 13, and they made sacrifices to this angelic host. And we, it says the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And when they saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. And the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah was even scared. In verse 22, he said, uh, we're going to die. He tells his wife, he said, we're going to die. We have seen God. We're going to die. But his wife said to him, and as Bobby said this morning, we have to look to our wives a lot of times. We get, you know, sort of off balance, and she puts it into perspective. If the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering, nor would he have shown us that these things would he have told us such things at this time. So the woman bore a son and named him Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him. And Manah Dan between Zorah and Eshtel. So we see that he's set apart for service. And we see that his mother has agreed with the Lord to raise him in the right way. He was set apart for service. In fact, Samson would be a judge. You know, before Israel had kings, they had a leader that would, would rise up. This was after Joshua. It's before uh, Saul, and it's the period of the 12 judges. And these leaders would rise up. And it's not like a judge in the courtroom, although he could do that, but it was more of, uh, of a leader, a military commander, uh, all these things. And so Samson would be the last judge of Israel. So in, in chapter 14, moving along real quick, Samson went down to Timnah and saw the woman in Timnah, the daughter of the Philistines. This did not go well. This did not go well at the house. <laughs> he was not wanting to bring the type of woman home to Manoah and his wife that they expected, especially for a man set apart by God to be a Nazarite. Uh, so he went up and said, I have this woman of Timnah, the daughters of the Philistines. Now get her for me as a wife. Oh, my goodness. Boy, the thing started to really go downhill, didn't it? And they said to him, there's no woman among the daughters of your brethren who that you could call as your wife, and you have to go to the uncircumcised Philistines? They're our enemies, Samson. Why, why would you want to do such a thing? Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she pleases me. She pleases me. So for the first time, we see Samson's eyes start to lose focus. Um, and, and he starts to set his eyes on the world. We, and we are guilty of that. And we have to watch that, that, that we should not let our, our faith or commitment to God waver. But Samson did this. But to show you God's grace, God tried to work Samson through this and use it for his glory and for his good. So um, the Philistines were ruling over Israel. And Samson went down uh, with his father and mother, 
and went toward the vineyards of Timnah. He was going to meet his wife-to-be. But there was a young lion that came roaring against him. And you may have seen this in the story as well. Samson tore that lion apart with his bare hands as a lion, uh, he tore the lion apart as one would have torn a young goat apart. And he didn't have any weapons. He was not armed, and he destroyed this lion. But he did not tell his father and mother what he had done. They must have been separated, and this lion come up on them. And Samson went in there and destroyed this lion. Then it says he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased him well. So she just confirmed that she was the one for him in his mind. After some time, he returned to get her. He turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Now, this is the lion that he had slain. This lion had laid there and, and started to deteriorate. But what had happened is a swarm of bees were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands, and he went along his way eating it. Then he came to his father and mother, and he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Now, some say, well... He's broken one of the vows of the Nazarite. He's touched a dead body. And we think specifically uh, the Bible was referring to a dead human body. But nonetheless, he has touched a dead body. He's taken the honey out, and he shared it with his mother and father and did not even tell them that it was uh, from the carcass of a dead animal. So Samson is a big, he's, he's big on riddles. He likes to fool people. You know, he liked to show his smarts. And we all like to tell a good joke and trick people and all this stuff. But he takes it to the extreme. So after he had uh, went down to the woman, they had a feast, a wedding feast. And the wedding party was there. And they saw it. Uh, and they brought 30 companions from the people uh, of uh, the Philistines. And Samson broke this riddle on them. Listen to this now. Let me pose a riddle to you if you can solve it and explain it to me within the seven days of this feast. As long as this feast is going on, if you come back with the answer, I'm going to give you 30 uh, linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. That was the bet. You solve the riddle, this is what you get. But if you can't explain it to me by then, you have to give me 30 pieces of linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. And they said to him, Pose your riddle that we may hear it. Now, you're going to get this because I've already told you the story. But, you know, if you hadn't have heard this, it may be a little more difficult. Samson says, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Now, for three days, they, they put their heads together. They couldn't come up with the answer. What's he talking about? What, what is this? Out of the eater came something to eat. And out of the strong came something. What, what is he talking about? But on the seventh day, these guys put a diabolical plan together, and they went in to Samson's wife, to bed, and they said, listen, entice your husband so that he may explain the riddle, or else we're going to burn you and your father's house upon you. Wow. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? Then Samson's wife wept on him and said, you hate me. Oh, she's messing with a man, and this is the enemy of Israel. Uh, not only did she feel the pressure of doing what is right by her home folks, she was being threatened. She felt like she had to do it. He said, you do not love me. You have posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you didn't even tell me the answer. You didn't explain it to me, Samson. So the first little spat, wow. And he said to her, look, I've not even told my mother and father. So, so why should I explain it to you? Now she had wept on him seven days. This is in chapter 14, verse 17, as we move right along. While their feast lasted, and it happened on the seventh day, Samson told her. He's probably figured, you know, I've got it made now. Man, I've won this bet. You know, they're not going to figure it out. I'm going to tell her. She's gonna, she loves me. She's going to keep it to herself. But she explained the riddle to the sons of her people. So the men in the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, that was the bet, what is sweeter than honey 
and what is stronger than a lion. Wow. Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, and gave the changes of the clothing to those who had explained the riddle, those who had won the bet, and his anger was aroused, and he went back up to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been the best man. There's a lot going on here. He lost the bet, and he had such rage that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. So in order to pay the bet, he just went out and killed 30 innocent bystanders. They were Philistines, all he knew. If they had a Philistine stamp on, they were his enemy, except if they were a good-looking woman, apparently. But anyways, <laughs> he, he kills 30 and takes their garments and their linens and brings that back and pays the debt. But he's just all tore up over it. So he goes back to his father's house. In the meantime, the father of the bride, boy, things are going bad, man. When you put your eyes on, when you fix your eyes on the world and start being enticed, like we said this morning, that, that little bit of sin just grows and grows, doesn't it? So the, 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 the bride of the father says, he probably hates us. So you just go, you're, I'm going to give you the best man. You're his wife now. So, wow, what, this is crazy, isn't it? So, so she was given to his companion who had been the best man. So um, now chapter 15. I tell you, that's pretty good, Judy. 18 minutes in, we're in two chapters already. We're rolling. Uh, chapter 15. Verse 1. After a while in the time of the wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with the young goat. And he said, let me go into my wife and her room. But her father would not permit. Samson didn't know what had happened. He had... You know, he'd calm down and say, that, well, she is my wife. I mean, she did spoil the riddle and cost me a lot of pain. But she had my wife. So he takes a young goat, and he's going to go in, and the father of bride says, no, I really thought that you hated her. So I have given her to your companion, in other words, your best man. Is not her younger sister better than she? <laughs> Please take her instead. This was forbidden by any law to do this. But this man, I don't know if he felt like Samson was going to tear him apart or if he was just wanting to try to make up for it. But he says, listen, I've already given her away. <laughs> but now she has a younger sister who's better than her, I can tell you. Wow, that's, that's crazy, isn't it? Samson said to them, this did not please the man, by the way. This time <laughs> I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. You know something big's coming, right? So this man was not just a man of brawn and muscle. In fact, he may not have had a lot of uh, distinct muscle unless the Spirit of the Lord came on him. He had this superhuman strength when the Spirit of the Lord came on him. So we may have the wrong picture of Samson. What we may have in the storybooks and in the picture books is a, 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 a perception uh, or perspective of his spiritual strength and all this rippling muscle and giant size and all this. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes. Now, a muscle-bound man ain't going to be catching 300 foxes. And, you know, they didn't have those live traps with the door back then. They had snares. And I don't know how he caught them. But a period of time must have passed. And this man is so calculating and so focused on revenge that he has caught 300 foxes and he got them two by two and tied their tails together and put a torch in their tails. It's crazy, isn't it? This is outrageous. You think this is outrageous? It's outrageous. Anything to add? I'm going real fast. So you jump in. No. This is Julie Harris here. She's one of our children and youth directors, or she is a children and youth director. Bobby's associate pastor of student ministries. And, and I wanted her perspective because some of this stuff, this adds to the story that we've always heard. Is that not right? Yeah. It uh, definitely adds to it. You see the whole picture. Wow. And boy, stuff's just happening left and right. And it's hard to keep up with it. So he's tied the foxes tail to tail, 300 of them. So then he put the torches on fire and he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistine. So it's harvest time and the grains have dried in the field and they're going to harvest them 
and he has this diabolical plan. He turns these, these foxes in, and it and it it burned all the grain as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. So the Philistines said, "Who has done this? Who has perpetuated this evilness on our people?" And they answered, "Samson, the son-in-law of the Temanite, because he has taken his wife and given to her his companion." Well, these people talked a lot, didn't they? they? Told on each other, and yet everybody knew about it. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So what they had threatened her with, if she didn't give them the riddle, they went ahead and did anyways, even though she had given them the riddle because of what Samson had done. And this, this spread of, of, of outrageous sin and, and all these things had just kept going, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Samson said to them, so he found out about that. So if you did something like this, I'm going to take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he says, watch out, here I come. So this man attacked them with a hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Uh, he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock at Edom. The Philistines went up and encamped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lehi. The men of Judah says, why have you come up against us? So they answered, we've come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he has done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down the cleft of the rock at Edom and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What have you done? So that, they're scared now, the people of Israel, the, the people of Judah, and, and, and they know that the, that the Philistines are after Samson. So what do they do? They're just going to turn him in. They're going to turn the, the judge in. They're just giving him over. And he said to them, as they did to me, so I've done to them. But they said to him, we have come to arrest you. We're going to deliver you into their hand. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you not kill me yourself. In other words, don't you, my own people, kill me, but just hand me over to them. Just hand me over to them. So those people spoke to him. No, we're, we're just going to deliver you to them. We're not going to kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes. As we'll see later, that's no match for Samson. Sam, he busted out those ropes on the road. Just right out, new ropes. And, and so this is not going to be good for them. But anyways, they led him to the Philistines, and here come the Philistines shouting against him. Does that remind you of another re uh, account in the Bible of a famous king mm -hmm. when he was a shepherd boy? Uh, so the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arm become like flax that is burned with fire, and they fell off and broke loose. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey just laying there. The donkey hadn't been dead long, and his, of course it decomposed, but there was a, the jawbone, and he got that jawbone, and he took it, and he killed a thousand men with it. Then he said, with a jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with a jawbone of a donkey, I've slain a thousand men. And when it was, he finished speaking, and he threw the jawbone from his hand. And that place is called Ramoth Lehi, and he became very thirsty. So he cried out to the Lord, said, you have delivered me into the hand of your servant now. Shall I die from thirst? So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out, and he drank. And his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore he called his name Anachor, which is in Lehi today. And he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. And I'm thirsty. God did that miraculous work. It takes a lot to kill a thousand men. Samson's thirsty. There's no water to be had. And he goes to God. And God is still trying to use this man for, for his glory, for God's glory. Even though Samson had cast his eyes upon the Philistines and the world was drawn. Now, he was killing the, Israel, uh, the enemy of Israel. And that was part of God's plan as a judge that he would lead his people against these evil, evil, uncircumcised Philistines. But it gets worse for old Samson. Chapter 6, anything to add you? we got 13, 14, boy, and I've not even been 30 minutes yet. 13, we're rolling. So we're about to be done here in a minute. One more chapter. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went in to her. So here he is out in the world, and he's went down to, to Gaza, 
and went into a harlot. The guys that uh, were told Samson has come in here, they surrounded that place and lay in wait for him at the night gate of the city. Wow. They were quiet all night. And they hid and they said, listen, in the morning when it's daylight, go get him. We're going to kill him. We're going to end his little reign of terror on our people. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight. Now listen to this. He took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts. He pulled them up out of the ground, bar and all now, put him on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Wow. Now, <laughs> get this in our mind. This is how mighty God's power is. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. This city gate, as we did research on this, some theorized that this, this thing weighed uh, 8,000 pounds. I don't know how they figured it. I don't know, you know, if they did went back in ancient ruins. And, but regardless, it was heavy. But they, they theorized it weighed four tons. And he carries this thing uh, up to the, the top uh, of this place. Uh, he carries the city gate uh, to the top of the hill that faces heaven. This is, you know how, I know Bobby and Julie, y'all been out west and these mountains, you said, you can see them and you just, it takes forever to get to them. They're so big, they look like they're right there. But they're not, they're not there. <laughs> you just get, well, this, this mount that faces Hebron, it's kind of like that. It's up there, but by the time you make the track from where Samson tore the city gate up out of the ground, put it on his shoulders and carried it 38 miles uphill. You know, your mom and dad used to say we walked to school in the snow. We could do uphill, yeah, barefooted. But Samson really did do it, though. A miraculous Ooh. burst of strength. And here these people thought they were going to get him. So <laughs> Samson is a rounder, let me tell you. Verse 4, after this happened, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek. So here's where Delilah enters the story. You heard about Delilah, and I know y'all been sitting there, when's, when's Delilah going to come out? Samson and Delilah, so, when's she going to show up? He's messed up. That thing. He don't know what he's talking about. That's not according to the storybooks. But, <laughs> but, but this is God's word. This is the real Samson now. Strong as the books say, probably even stronger than you thought, right? Right. Uh, what he has accomplished, but yet it's all because of God's power and God's strength. Now, <clears throat> he falls <laughs> in love with this Delilah. After he's went in with this prostitute, he, he's just out in the world. And the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, entice him. We, we've got to do something with this guy. He's killing us. Um, we want to find out where his great strength lies. And that's where we think that he was probably looked like anybody else because obviously... If it had been uh, the second coming of the, or the first coming of the Hulk, I guess, if it had been something, you know, like this, that, well, he's strong, okay. But they really didn't know. They wanted to know where his strength came from because he must have looked like a murderer. We don't know that, but we perceive that by the way they're responding to him. So they said, we want to know so we can overpower him and bind him and afflict him. And uh, <clears throat> by the way, Delilah, if you do this, we'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver. That's a fortune. So Delilah said, Samson. So Samson comes in after she's met with these people. Where do you get your great strength? And she probably put her hands and, man, I don't know how you're so strong. But I want to know, uh, you know, how do you do it? And Samson said, listen, if they'll bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, they have not been die, dried, rather. I shall become weak and be like any other man. So he's just messing with her. He ain't telling her. You know, so um, the lords of the Philistines brought her up to seven, seven bowstrings and bound him with them. And they laid in a weight. And when she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson, he jumped up and broke those bow strings just like they were yarn in the fire, it said. just poof. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then some time passed. Right back to it now. She's very persistent. 
I don't know if she's wanting to please her countrymen or get the silver, or both, probably. I don't know. But the Delilah said to Samson, look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now, please tell me what you may be known. And he said, bind me with new ropes that have never been used, and I shall become weak like any other man. She did this. She took two new ropes and bound him, and then she did the same thing. She had them guys waiting out there. The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And there was a man lying in wait, staying in the room. But the, he broke them off like thread. Can you imagine that? These are new ropes. They probably had him a lot. Just, he just snapped them like thread. The Spirit of the Lord was so powerful. Um, so Delilah <clears throat> is very upset. Verse 13, she said, You have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with that will, will take your strength. And he said to her, listen, if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, that'll do. That'll do. So she did that. Then she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he woke up, and he pulled out of his hair from the loom. Tricked her in. So she said to him, how can you say I love you and your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times. We went through this three times and you've done the same thing. You just used a different method. You won't tell me where your strength lies. Why not? So she pestered him daily about this and it pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. <laughs> she wore him out. She talked him into submission. She, <laughs> she just wore him down. And so he told her, as, as all of his heart, it says. So Samson is emptying out. Um, before, you know, there was a piece of him that still clung to that Nazarite vow. But now he's just willing to give it all up. He's forgotten. He said, no razor has ever come upon my head. For I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other so love is blind, is it not? And we will see that literally comes true. So when Delilah had saw that he had told her all of his heart, she loved him and they lived happily ever after. No, that's not how sin works. That's how the devil would think us to, oh, she just loved him and she's going to let it go. No, that didn't happen. The Bible says she sent and called for the Lord of the Philistines. She said, come up one more time, for I've got him now. I've got the answer for you. So he told me this with all of his heart. So they laid the money in her hand. They were so confident. Here it is. She lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave the seven locks off his head. And she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Listen to this. So he awoke from his sleep. I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. So he was deceived. You know, he'd become overconfident. He, 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 he had he put all his confidence in his ability, in his strength. And what Samson did not realize is that it was the strength of the Lord within him that was working these mighty and miraculous acts for the glory of God. So he was sanctified by the Lord himself with this unique relationship from the womb, set apart to be a judge, a leader over Israel. Now we have a shaven commitment. He's just, he's just released everything from his heart that was good and right. Samson's strength comes from this unique relationship with God. The hair was just a symbol. It's like a wedding band is a symbol of your marriage. If you take that uh, wedding band off and throw it down, it doesn't mean you're not married. It's a symbol. The hair was a symbol of the re unique relationship he had with God. It was the spirit that came upon him that brought this great strength because of this unique abiding relationship. Samson had turned his eyes off of God and put it on himself, on himself in the world. The supernatural strength was removed. So the, the hair was in proportion 
to the deep faith that he had in God. Now, he'd give up his heart before his hair was shaven. That was just a sign, wasn't it? Samson played around with sin. He played this lying game. You know, he, he thought he was smarter than sin. He, really did. he thought he was smarter than silver. He thought he was smarter than this woman. You know, he liked that, those riddles, and they always caught him in the end, even though they did cheat. Uh, he, he played this lying game, but he told her all. His commitment could be bought with a price, and Delilah paid it. Now, we see the same thing in the life of Esau. You remember when Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of stew? You remember that? Wow. You remember Judas sold our Lord? 30 pieces of silver. So we've seen people do this. But the unique story about Samson, and this is the exciting thing, as bad as it gets, Samson had one more act of faith that he would offer to God. He would return in a mighty way to God. He would have his strength renewed. Let's finish out the chapter in our study tonight on outrageous, the story of Samson. So verse 23. Now back up, verse, verse 21. We didn't go over that. He had, you know, they had taken him in captive. His strength had left him. They had bound him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes. They gouged out the man's eyes. You know, uh, in Matthew's gospel, we're told that if, if your eye offends you, you better pluck it out from, you know, the, in the parish. It's better to go in. So it, it's a hyperbole. And, but this is literal. Samson, he lost focus on the things of God and the things to serve God, on himself and the world. Now it has literally cost him his eyesight. They brought him down to Gaza. Then they bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. Wow. Wow. Now look what happens on the other side. However, I like it when but or however follows a bad thing. Because what does that mean, Julie? It means it's fixing to turn around. It's going to be good, yeah. Now, if I, however and but follows a good thing, Oh, boy, you know, it's going the other way. But this time it's following a bad thing. They've gazed out his eye. They've made him a sideshow, virtually. Come and look at this guy. That's the mighty Samson. <laughs> look at him now. He's like an animal. He just goes grinding in the prison. And there he was, round and round. Don't tell how many rounds he made grinding. Walking that, that wheel, that, that pole that drove that wheel, just grinding over and over, remembering what he had and what he had lost. But here, however, the Bible says in verse 22, the hair of his head began to grow after it had been shaven. And this is represented, I know it's, it's hair is growing back, but this again, this again is in accordance or proportion to his faith. He is getting back to God. You know, sometimes God got to set us down and give us a refocus Samson didn't have any choice. His eyes were gouged out. He was taken into custody. And here he was, grinding at the wheel every day. So, yes, his hair began to grow. But I, because, I, I believe that's because his faith began to return to the mighty God. Only man only had one haircut in his life. Mm. But now, now things are changing. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, uh, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. Wow. <laughs> now, <laughs> we know what happened when Elijah uh, went against the prophets of Baal, don't we, 450 of them? They were a little overconfident, weren't they? You know, his gods were powerless, and so was Dagon. Dagon was a god with a fish head, and, and they thought he was a uh, god of the seas and fertility and all this crazy stuff. Yeah, I remember that song, Roly Poly Fish Heads. Don't you remember that? <laughs> you remember that song? No. Fish heads, fish heads, Roly Poly Fish Heads. Fish heads, fish heads, eat them up, yum. Yeah, that's an old song. 
See what that's that <laughs> false god over there, Samson fixing to eat their lunch. When the people saw him, they praised their God, and they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the store of our land, and the one who multiplied our deed. He has killed our people. He's from the, that evil bunch over there in Israel, and we've got him, and they ain't got a chance now. So what happened when their hearts were merry, they said, call for Samson, and he may perform for us. The circus side show. They thought they had it locked up. And he performed for him, them, and they stationed him between the pillars. Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, this is the guy that led him over there, put me where I can feel these pillars and, 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 and put me in between them so I can support and lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women, and this <clears throat> you gotta get the vision of these big gigantic pillars right in the middle to support. He put him Samson in the middle of these pillars, and this roof was the was the virtual um, what do you call that uh, on top? Uh, the yeah the uh, uh, what do you call that up there? You know you got seats up yonder. Balcony. The balcony, yeah. The, I couldn't think of it. <laughs> So the, they were all sitting up there, 3,000 of them up there, sitting on the platform that's supported by the pillars where Samson had been brought. And, and he, he had this in his mind. He could feel that strength, that, that faith in God that he had. And he, oh, man, they've gouged out my eyes. I cannot be of service like I used to be, but I can do one more mighty act in faith for my God. Samson, verse 28, this is important you get this. Because here's this, this prayer, a prayer of repentance and trust that pours from a heart that has returned to the mighty God. And he said, then he called to the Lord saying, Oh, Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. So he had heard all the boasting. He'd heard how their god Dagon, which is a false god that looked like a roly-poly fish head. And he's tired of it. And he wants to make restitution for what he's done. He wants to do a mighty act for God's people. And he took hold of those two pillars which supported the temple and the seating above. He braced himself against him and on his right hand other on his left then he said, let me die with these Philistines. And he pushed with all of his might. And the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. And the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and fathers came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Estel and the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. So this man who had departed from God, who had lost his vision, who lost his focus, and it cost him his very eyesight, and his very life, life and his, his uh, times of service for those people. In one mighty act, he had this strength renewed. He prayed. With his eyes gone, he had to see with his spirit. You know, this wasn't an act of suicide at all. It was... It was just letting God release his judgment on his enemies and, and willing to just give his own life that God's will would be done. And the, the talk of this false God and the victory of this false God would be put to rest. Staying true. You say, well, that's great, but man, it sounds like you left on bad terms. Turn with me uh, in closing here to uh, Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Now, you know what chapter 11 is, don't you? We talked about this before. Chapter 11 is the chapter of faith. But we like to call it the Faith Hall of Fame. And in it, the book tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, that 
all the things that we see are not made of things which are visible. And then he goes and recounts all the way from the beginning of man, starting with Abel and that sacrifice uh, that he offered to God, which got him killed, and Enoch and how he was taken up uh, alive because he had pleased God, he didn't die. And uh, we see in verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Then it goes into Noah, and on so forth. And you need to read that whole chapter. And in, it, in verse 17, he talks about Abraham and Isaac, the, the, the patriarchs and the faith of these patriarchs, and about Isaac and Jacob and Esau. And, he, and then if you keep going, he, he talks about Moses. Now, this is indeed the Faith Hall of Fame. Wouldn't you agree? Um, and then when you get down to about uh, verse 32, he starts talking about the judges. And who, here's who Samson's mentioned with. And what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms or righteousness obtained promises stopped the mouths of lions quenched the violence of fire escaped to the edge of the sword out of weakness were made strong become valiant in battle and turned to fight the armies of the aliens so Samson was an A-lister on the faith Hall of Fame. He had his times. But he did a great work for God. A man of great power and strength. All because it was ordained of God. And this is just a picture of us today. You know, we we have great capabilities within us by the power of the Spirit. We may not have superhuman strength, although if God chose to give you that, we know that in times of distress, uh, the adrenaline rush of the body sometimes has caused people to have superhuman strength to, to lift cars up of all, off of people or, or to move trees that were just immovable and to do this uh, miraculous, powerful things in times of distress. But we know God can do whatever so he wills. But we are also, as Christian people, to have the right attitude. We're not to be intoxicated. The Bible says do not be drunk with wine, which is an excess but we feel with the Spirit. We're to have the right appearance. And it's not talking about what kind of clothes you wear. It's talking about an appearance, the, the, the outer you, what smile on your face. Appear as a joyful Christian of who you are. And it's about the right action. It's about doing God's will. It's about serving God and being sanctified as we are as believers in Christ. Set apart for service. That's what uh, that's what that whole thing was about, Samson. Uh, the Nazarite vow, that's being set apart. That's what it means, it's being set apart. So the true picture of Samson, a great leader, and he proved even in his death, willing to give his life for his people. He's, I'm going to take out as many of them as I can because I'm done. My eyes are gone. I'm done. But one more time, God, one more time, and God blessed this. That's all I have about it. Samson, there's lots of other things I guess we could inflict. That's four chapters in about 45 minutes. So, Miss Julie, anything to add? Any things? No, I liked it. It's different. It's different. That's the true Samson. That's the true Samson. And he made the faith hall of fame. That's right. God rewarded his faithfulness, didn't he? God rewarded his faithfulness. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. And I want to thank all those that helped us put this together. We're we're excited about this coming week. I want you to join us Wednesday um, at 6.30. There'll be no fit to serve this Tuesday again, but Wednesday at 6.30 we'll have our prayer meeting, and Bobby and Julie will be coming to give us our discipleship group study. We're looking forward to that. Discipleship has been such a great blessing on me personally, and I know it has on the church and those who have taken part in it. I mean, it's just now to the point, don't you don't you think it's it's just now part of your life. You're gonna get up. Yep. You're gonna pray, you're gonna get uh, look at your book, get those verses and 
read them and then you got plenty of time during the course of the week to do those personal studies and you actually look forward to your D group meeting, don't you? I do. Amen. I do. So uh, it's all about the right action, being in God's service. And we want to invite you again on Wednesday night at 6.30. And we're looking forward to next Sunday. Amen. It's, I don't know, we're going to be back together, Lord willing. We plan on it. I, I don't think there's uh, you know, any reason we can't uh, next Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, have our Sunday school classes active again. And you know, looking forward to hearing, uh, although Donna and Laura blessed us with two great specials. During this two weeks. Wonderful job. And I know they're looking forward to having our musicians and, and our other singers back as well as we join together to praise God and worship him a week from today on Sunday. Anything else? Anybody got anything? Let's close the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the call that you have on all of us that a mighty and holy God would use someone like us, so insignificant, God, so disobedient and rebellious, however you're long-suffering, just waiting on us to turn to you, God, to seek forgiveness of the sin and the rebellious acts we've committed against you. Oh, God, please forgive me where I failed. Lord, I want to be used in your service. I want to keep my eyes on you, God, and what you have for us to do. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your love, your excellent mercies, and we just pray that we would all use our spiritual eyes and the spiritual strength by, by the Holy Spirit of God. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for indwelling us and giving us this supernatural God ability to understand your word and to practice it and to exercise your power and authority on this earth as you have called us to do. Thank you for this holy and mighty calling, God. And may we always seek your will. And Lord, for those who are backslidden and who want to be in that will again, you tell us in your word, if we just simply turn to you by faith, seeking forgiveness, that you will remove all that sin from us and restore that relationship and make us whole with you again. If there is any God among us out there that are of the idea and mind of the Philistine people, and that worship the false gods of this world. May they turn to you, God, by faith with all of their heart and confess you and call on you to salvation, God, for forgiveness of sin. And Lord, you tell us in your word, if we'll call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will save us by faith. God, thank you for this holy promise. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you next time. See you next time.